Welcome everyone. We'll give folks just another moment or two to log on and then we'll get started. Okay. Hello, I'm Chelsea Lake. I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PMP Live. Thank you for joining us in this virtual format in which we strive to bring you the authors we all love to our Politics and Prose community. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. At any point during the event, you can click on the link that I'll be dropping in the chat to purchase Citadels of Pride, Sexual Abuse, Accountability, and Reconciliation on the Politics and Prose website. You can also ask a question by clicking on the Q&A feature, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions, but I apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. We are delighted to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To access captions, simply click on the live transcript option at the bottom of your screen. Finally, thank you again for being with us here today. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Martha C. Nussbaum is the Ernst Freund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics at the University of Chicago, appointed in the Law School and Philosophy Department. She's the author of numerous books and articles on moral, legal, and political philosophy, and the recipient of many awards, including the Kyoto Prize, the Bergrun Prize, and the recent winner of the Holberg Prize. She lives in Chicago, Illinois. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nussbaum to PMP Live. Professor? Thank you so much, Chelsea. And it's a great pleasure to be in my, my very favorite bookstore. And I wish I was there in Washington and that all of you were here in person, but it's great to, to be with you. It's always a pleasure to talk at Politics and Prose. These are revolutionary times for American women and men. A recent flood of testimony has shown that for generations, our society has harbored a culture of sexual violence and sexual harassment. Many, many women have been treated as mere things, objects for male pleasure and use. Their dignity disrespected, their inner experiences ignored. Now, this very old problem has entered the foreground of public awareness in a new way, challenging all Americans to heed belatedly women's long ignored demand for justice and equal respect. The decency and basic justice of our society hangs in the balance. The information brought out by the Me Too movement that began in 2017 is not really new. For more than 50 years, American women have been telling their stories of sexual violence and workplace harassment in pursuit of justice for all women. And many creative and determined lawyers and policymakers have been working hard to reshape both criminal and civil law to deal more adequately with sexual assault, a criminal offense, and sexual harassment defined in our country as a civil offense of sex discrimination under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. One objective of my book is to tell that frequently ignored set of stories so that we understand that America's march to justice has been long and is the work of many unheralded contributors not just recent celebrities, valuable though the contributions of the latter have certainly been. America's unfinished march toward equality for women and men has made progress over the years, and the Me Too movement has begun to make yet more progress. There remain, however, significant barriers to full accountability. A second major objective of this book is to pinpoint those areas of recalcitrance and to analyze the reasons why they have resisted reform. I'll be arguing that greed is a major impediment. Men who seem irreplaceable and who make a lot of money for other people, especially in sports and in media and the arts, 
are still all too likely to be insulated from full accountability, their misdeeds covered up. The federal judiciary is yet another area in which powerful figures who often seem indispensable to those whose interests they serve are similarly insulated, at least until very recently, with reforms as yet far from adequate. Defects in accountability stemming from greed require institutional and structural solutions, and I will propose some for each area. Above all, I'll argue that the vice of pride is at work in the still all too common tendency to treat women as mere objects, denying them equal respect and full autonomy. Pride as I define it, really going taking off from Dante's purgatory, is the vice that consists of thinking that you are above everyone else and that other people are not fully real. This vice can be found at the source of several of the deepest problems in our national life, including racial superiority and privilege and indifference and disdain on the basis of class. But one place where pride surely has ruled is in relations between men and women. Dominant men refusing women recognition as full and equal persons have resisted the creation of laws that empower women to defend their bodily integrity and assert their agency. And even when, nonetheless, these laws manage to be created, many men resist their sway, creating outposts, which I call citadels of pride, where they take shelter and avoid accountability. Like any major social political revolution, ours is the best of times, meaning a time of budding hope for full justice, but it is also the worst of times, a time of pain and turbulence when established patterns have been challenged, but people are very unsure about how to go forward and are often filled with resentments on both sides, responding to the injustices of the past and the magnitude of the changes. When Charles Dickens used those two descriptions to characterize the French Revolution, one thing he had in mind was that a push for justice can lead to an outbreak of retributive emotion that does not serve justice well and that actually retards human progress. Our time contains similar dangers where women and men are concerned. Ours is a time when women speak clearly and proudly, demanding justice and respect. It is also a time when some men react in fear and anger, resenting lost privileges and demonizing feminism as the source of their discontent. And sadly, it's also a time when some women not only ask for equal respect, but also seem to take pleasure in retribution. Instead of a prophetic vision of justice and reconciliation, these women prefer an apocalyptic vision in which the former oppressor is brought low and this vision parades as justice. No, justice is something very different, requiring nuances, distinctions, and forward-looking strategies to bring the warring parties to the table of peace. In this book, I argue that on this issue, as with so many others, retributive emotion is no help. We all need to go forward somehow into a shared future, women and men. And we need to start building that future now rather than focusing on the infliction of retrospective pain. That's not to say that part of the institutional solution doesn't involve punishment of aggressors. Punishment is useful and often necessary to deter the offender, to deter others from offending, to express society's most important values, and to educate society as a whole about the importance of good behavior. But punishment accomplishes those legitimate goals only if it is law-based, fair, nuanced, and calibrated to the severity of the offense. The Me Too movement has seen its share of cases in which punishment has not been nuanced or calibrated, in which mass shaming takes the place of procedural justice. It has also spawned narratives in which reconciliation is dismissed in favor of retributive triumphalism. Following the lead 
of both feminist Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Martin Luther King Jr. I shall call for a revolution that fully recognizes the equal human dignity of all people and that moves forward to create a new world, a world in which, as King put it, men and women may live together. But let's say women and men, since it's time for Americans to change the customary order of our thinking. In short, this is a book about justice, but justice that seeks reconciliation and a shared future. This kind of justice has a central role for law. Law and what's usually called the rule of law embody a vision of equal dignity and fair due process. And though law is finite and its process is flawed, American women have been able to turn to the law and to legal change in a way that has not always been possible for women in nations in which the law is more deeply flawed and corrupted at its very core. But law does its job well, only when people understand it. And in America today, people interested in justice for women don't always understand the relevant laws and their historical background. A large part of my purpose in this book is to describe the relevant areas of law and their history clearly, so that any reader who wants to use the law or to study it further will be pretty well placed to do so. This means that my discussion sometimes may seem technical because the impartiality of law means that it is in fact technical, avoiding colorful particulars and personal narratives. Narratives do play a role in the evolution of the law because ours is what's known as a common law system in which law develops incrementally through cases. And I'll be telling the stories of some crucial cases. But I want my readers to embrace the larger goal of creating a system that stands for all and that is fair to all, standing above any narrative and immune to bias and favor, or at least so it should be. The very abstractness of law embodies a noble moral ideal. We have worked so hard to win our way past this or that particular story toward a vision of unbiased justice for all. We should not let the natural desire for narrative color betray that struggle. Law in that way embodies a vision of reconciliation. Each tells her story, but not just for herself, seeking instead a result that brings all together and stands for all. Women's lack of full equality in American society has many dimensions. Lack of equal pay, continuing obstacles to full political representation, the huge gnawing problem of care labor and its unequal distribution in families across our nation, the stubborn problem of women's vulnerability to domestic violence. Each of these deserves a book. In this particular book, I've chosen to focus on sexual assault and sexual harassment. Of course, they overlap with domestic violence, uh, obviously enough, in part because these issues are current flashpoints for women's demands for justice, for resistance to those demands, and for occasional retributive overreach. I believe that a good approach to the difficult issues of sexual assault and sexual harassment will indicate a spirit in which other issues might be constructively addressed. The issues on which I focus furthermore are issues for which law has previously been a culprit, giving women inadequate protection, and in which recent legal work has begun at least to undo that history of wrong. So they provide a valuable theater in which to study the interplay between legal and institutional change and underlying societal struggles. Well, now I'm gonna to go to uh, another question, but just let me remind you that it's, uh, now that you, you're all here, do please consider asking a question on the Q&A box. Okay, now that you know the book's overall scope and purposes, what has led me to engage with this topic at this time? First of all, over 30 years of feminist teaching and scholarship. Since around 1990, I've regularly taught a course called Feminist Philosophy, attempting to deal respectfully and fairly with all the major varieties of feminism. 
And I have learned a lot from the writings I teach, especially the ones that I don't agree with. I've learned even more from my successive generations of students, especially from their critical challenges. I've also had the good fortune to spend the past 25 years at one of the nation's premier law schools, where I've been steeped in conversations about the criminal and civil law, and have had daily conversations with some of the country's best legal thinkers about these issues. I'm also a woman, and like so many women in our society, I have been a victim of both sexual harassment and sexual assault. I've written about both of those things, and I see no value in narrating my particular experiences again, since really we all know by now that such things happen so often to so many women. I also don't want this to be a story of victimhood, and I am seeking a perspective that is fair to all involved, as I believe we should always do in life. Instead, I prefer to turn to the stories of many women, to the law's obtuseness, and to courageous efforts toward change. Now I'll give you a capsule summary. In part one of the book, I dive immediately into the attitudes and emotions that brought Americans to this crisis and that impede a lasting peace. I look first at the key concept of objectification, often used in feminist thought, namely the, the idea that you treat a person as a mere object. And that concept illuminates much of the path before us if the concept is itself dissected with sufficient clarity. But I then say, well, what's behind that? I then look for a trait that fuels the longstanding objectification of women and the denigration of women's full equality, namely the vice or character trait of pride, which underlies so much abuse of power, along with its relatives, greed and envy. In Dante's masterful poetic account of the vice of pride in the Purgatorio, the proud are depicted as bent over like hoops so that they can't look out at others. They, they can only see parts of their own bodies. They treat others as objects because they don't really see them and they don't really hear them. They see and hear only themselves. Because pride plays a pernicious role in racism and class inequality, as well as in sex discrimination, it offers us a way of understanding how one form of abuse is related to others, and especially at this time in our national life, it invites us to reflect on how an unacceptable racial subordination and an unacceptable sexual subordination are intertwined aspects of a diseased national culture. In part two, I turn to history and to law. I give a brief account of the gradual revolution in criminal law that has led to more adequate standards for rape and sexual assault and to better treatment of victims. Because in our country, criminal laws are state laws, for the most part anyway, this revolution has of necessity been plural, messy, and complex. And it's taken about 50 years and it's still imperfect. Meanwhile, at the federal level, feminists have pursued a different strategy, seeking protection against workplace sexual harassment by using two civil anti-discrimination laws, Title VII and later Title IX of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The key theoretical move was to get people to agree that workplace sexual harassment is discrimination on grounds of sex. Before this feminist work, most men and perhaps even many women thought that workplace harassment was a kind of unpleasant bad behavior, erotically motivated and personal. Few would have seen it as a case of discrimination. To secure agreement that it is really discrimination was a major victory of feminist thought and lawyering. Sexual harassment is a civil offense in which the defendant is not the individual perpetrator, but it is the employer or the institution. But a plaintiff can succeed if she can show either that some type of quid pro quo was demanded of her in the employment context, or that the harassment, even if it didn't have a quid pro quo attached, created what's known as a hostile work environment. 
and that her repeated complaints brought no redress. I examined the theory of sex discrimination that led to these legal developments and traced the main outlines of the case law. Sexual assault and sexual harassment can of course overlap since harassment often does include some type of assault, although it need not. But the two involve altogether different legal strategies, standards, and concepts. And one of my aims is to dispel prevalent confusion about those distinctions. Then next in an interlude, I more briefly inspect the current atmosphere of controversy and uncertainty surrounding sexual assault and sexual harassment on the campus of colleges and universities, suggesting how we may going forward strike an appropriate balance between accountability for victims and due process for the accused. One aim of part two is to make people more aware of the history and current situation of the law in these areas and the areas in which further reform is needed. But I also focus on law because it's important to see that women have made progress less because of celebrities who come forward with their tales of abuse, important though these recent disclosures have been, than because of the tireless efforts of hundreds of working women and often working class women, plaintiffs and their lawyers, and of activists who pressed for legal change. And by the way, I, I focus on the way in which black women have been central both as plaintiffs and as lawyers. Progress has been won not so much by the public shaming characteristic of the Me Too movement, which is fraught with problems as much as promise, as because of impartial stru structures that both allow victims to be heard and protect the accused. Law can and must do better, but it's one of the best things we have. The fundamental issue, part two insists, is not sex or eroticism, it is power. Sexual abuse and sexual harassment, as feminists have long contended, are abuses of power by people encouraged to believe that they're above others and that others are not fully real. Culturally, men have been the dominant group in hierarchies of power, so the abusers this book considers are mostly male. I think actually all the particular ones are male. But people lower in the power hierarchy may be victimized whether male or female. And this book does consider some cases in which the victims are male. My approach through pride has three important consequences. First, sexual abuse and harassment should be seen as closely akin to other abuses of power, abuses on the basis of race and class. Second, at times, sexual abuse itself targets males lower in the power hierarchy. Third, women are especially vulnerable to sexual abuse when they are also targets of a racialized or class-based abuse of power. So this book is in a way about women, but it's really about hierarchies of power and the abuses they engender in people who are raised to think that they're above the law and that other people are not fully real. Part three turns to three recalcitrant areas of our national life. In some areas, despite Me Too, powerful men remain above the law. When men are shielded by long lasting institutional structures that give them enormous power, they may continue to do wrong with impunity. These citadels of pride, as I call them, insulate men who objectify and demean women from accountability. I select three areas to exemplify this problem. First, I look at the federal judiciary. Here, the cult-like structure of the clerk-judge relationship, combined with inadequate structures to protect whistleblowers, has given rise to a corrupt sexual culture in which, given the power dynamics, women are more likely than men to suffer abuse and harassment. I look closely at the careers of the retired Judge Alex Kaczynski and the late Judge Stephen Reinhardt as examples of a culpable failure of accountability. Recent structural reforms instituted by a group formed by Chief Justice Roberts have improved things, but there's still, I think, a lot of further work to be done. 
Impunity is highlighted by greed, a frequent ally of the vice of pride. As my first example of the greed problem, I look at the performing arts, where big stars who make a lot of money for other people are all too often shielded by others. Here again, the structures themselves are defective and the highly unstable nature of employment, especially in theater and film, magnifies the problem. Because the area of performing art that I know best is classical music and opera, I examined four cases from that field, David Daniels, Charles Dutois, Placido Domingo, and the late James Levine. Here again, I believe that reforms in institutional structures already underway under pressure from the performing arts unions can achieve a great deal, but a vigilant public is also key to the prevention of future abuses. Finally, I study big money college sports, in particular division one football and basketball. I study these after showing how in, profes in professional sports, tougher regulation has begun to rein in abuse as in many other workplaces around the country. But the case of college sports, I argue, is different. Here, a collective action problem, as so many are competing for such a small number of outstanding talents, combined with financial pressure created by investment groups who ally themselves in dubious ways with the academic institutions, nurture cultures of both sexual and academic corruption that the reform attempts of the NCAA have proven powerless to dismantle. Here alone, I argue that reform of the structures is not possible. And I recommend, I'm sure this is the most controversial thing I say in this book, probably, the complete abolition of division one college football and basketball in favor of a minor league system such as long been in place in baseball. Here I'm echoing NBA commissioner Adam Silver's call and I, I thank him for his help and advice on this book, his call for dismantling the unhealthy nexus between colleges and investment companies and replacing them with genuine professionalization as typified by the increasing success and quality of basketball's G League combined as Silver wishes and projects with learning academies that ought to ensure, as the current system does not, that young athletes will have marketable skills should their sports careers not prosper. In all of these analyses, I draw on part one's analysis of the vices of domination, focusing particularly on pride and greed. This is a tough book, one that does not allow the tender emotions to become an excuse for weakness or retreat from accountability. But it's also a book committed to finding a path forward. I argue that retributive emotions and demands do not provide that way forward. The only genuine opening to a shared future involves tough-minded insistence on accountability combined with a spirit of constructive work, generosity of spirit, and what we might call affirmative love. Wounded people become retributive easily, and we ought to sympathize with this reaction to genuine trauma. But sympathy is not a justification. Parents who have lost a child to criminal violence often become obsessed with capital punishment, but that understandable response does not justify capital punishment or make the parent's attitude healthy or helpful. In criminal justice, more generally, victims often become obsessed with revenge in an unhealthy way and so-called victim impact statements in the penalty phase of a criminal trial often taint the trial with retributive overreach, jeopardizing the fairness of the criminal justice process. There's much more than emotion involved in creating a culture of accountability with reconciliation, but as Martin Luther King Jr. knew and taught, getting the spirit and the emotions right is essential in guiding our more specific efforts. Many feminists do believe that retributive anger is a powerful aid to the feminist struggle, even if they also acknowledge that it distorts the personality. In keeping with my previous work on anger and retribution, I argue in this book that the retributive type of anger 
namely the type that's aimed at proportional payback or inflicting retrospective pain is not a help in the feminist struggle. I'm with King who wrote in an essay in 1959 that that sort of anger is confused and not radical. I think that was very interesting that he said that. It follows a blind strike back impulse. Rather than asking what will help, as King puts it, to create a world where women and men can live together. Denouncing bad policies and opposing people who hold them in their bid for high office is part of creating a good future. But that legitimate and principled denunciation is difficult to disentangle from the mere desire to win by striking back and putting your opponent down. We all need to ponder that distinction very carefully. This is what King called purifying one's anger, trying always for the future directed type of anger that I call transition anger, an anger that turns to face the future, an anger that says, that's outrageous and bad, that must not happen again. As for public punishment by shaming, social media have in a way brought us straight back to the witch trials and the pillory, a culture in which it's possible to give people what sociologist Irving Goffman called a spoiled identity without any due process and no possibility of reintegration. I've long criticized the use of public shaming in the criminal law as when people convicted of a given offense are made to wear signs or placards on their car or their person or their property. Critics of this type of punishment have made five strong arguments. First, these punishments insult human dignity by branding a whole person as defective, not just a single act. This is a crucial distinction between act and person is a face. Second, they depart from the ideal of the rule of law, asking the crowd to administer the punishment. Third, throughout history, they have proven unreliable, migrating from people who have really done something bad to people who are merely unpopular or ugly or marginal. Fourth, they often increase the total amount of violence in society because they create despair, inciting a desperate type of retaliation. And fifth, by punishing many things that are not illegal, they contribute to what's known as net widening, increasing society's total amount of social control. All these arguments seem to me to have merit, but in the version of punishment by shaming recently proposed by criminal law thinkers, the suggestion has at least this mitigating factor. The person has to be indicted, tried, and convicted first in the usual way by evidence and, and so on. Shaming enters in only at the penalty phase. Even so, these punishments are vulnerable to my five objections. But in social media culture, as with the use in so many places and times of the stocks, the pillory, and punitive tattooing and branding, there is no indictment, there is no trial, there is no evidence. The crowd is district attorney, judge, jury, and punisher. The new ascendancy of mob anger and retributive shaming is a huge threat in our society generally to the creation of a world of decency and mutual respect. And I think it's particularly important that feminists ought to see the ugliness of these strategies linked historically to witch blaming and other forms of misogyny. But instead, at times, some feminists seem to glory in public shaming both of males and of dissenting feminists. The virtue opposed to the vice of pride is not humility in the classic sense that you think yourself lower than others. It's closely connected to respect and the, as it were, reversal of the hoop-like posture of the people of pride. It involves the willingness to listen and see, to listen to the voices of others rather than closing off those voices and those faces in lofty superiority. Virtue at its best involves that type of inclusive listening and something that following King again, I would call love. 
That is, it involves seeing in all people a core of dignity and worth and further a potential for change and growth, however obscured and blighted by the history of that person's deeds. So it draws a very strong distinction between deeds and the underlying person. Deeds may be utterly denounced, but the person always retains potentiality and movement. That's why Dante's hell is so terrifying because you have people, but they're human beings stripped of all potentiality and therefore, of course, of all hope. And when living people are consigned to hell, this is its own very pernicious form of objectification. It robs them of autonomy, subjectivity, and possibility. At this time of justified denunciation and unremitting vigilance, feminists, I believe, should also, and above all, be people of love. Just as women demand that their voices be heard, so we must also resolve to hear one another in all our differences and to hear the voices of men, both those who agree with us and those who do not, both those who have behaved well and those who have not, creating a dialogical culture that is also a culture of empathetic imagination. To listen and to hear in a climate of respect for human potentiality. And because that potentiality is sometimes impossible to see, we should also be people of practical faith and of a trust that is to some extent as, as yet unjustified and unjustifiable. Even where hope cannot be supported by reasons, and really hope can never be fully supported by reasons, Feminists should be people of hope. Hope that the relationship between women and men, so long based upon domination, might enjoy what Abraham Lincoln called a new birth of freedom as mutuality and respect for autonomy gradually displace the vice of pride. Only that new freedom and that love can really create a just and lasting peace. Thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions. Wow, thank you so much. I'm going to pop open the q and I could go on listening to you for another 35 minutes, but let's see if we can get to some audience questions. Thank you very much to everybody who's put something in the box and we might have time for more, so keep them coming. Okay, anonymous attendee, you mentioned that you don't agree with the retributive bent of recent movements. Do you see restorative measures as an alternative to retribution, especially given that harassment often serves the function of hindering women's success, especially in male dominated fields? Yeah, well, thank you. Yes, I mean, I am uh, I'm a fan of restorative justice as a general approach. Whether it's appropriate in, in the criminal law context is a different question. I've been, I spent some time in New Zealand a couple of years ago where restorative justice is standardly used within the criminal trial. So the con con convicted defendant is ordered to undergo a restorative conferencing with the people that he or she has wronged. And, you know, sometimes I think that plays a good role. And if the conferencing is carefully monitored, as John Braithwaite, the great expert on this, has urged, he, he says you, you've got to have a mediator who prevents it from degenerating into mere retributivism, then I think it can be very helpful. But on the other hand, I also noticed in following this judge in New Zealand around, that there was a lot of victim overreach and there were victim impact statements that I thought were totally unhelpful. So that then if that had been followed by conferencing, I, I imagine that this poor young Maori man would be just clobbered by ret retributive overreach from the wealthy family whose car he had damaged and so forth. So, so I think, you know, if it's done right, yes. And it's certainly a very good thing to bring people together. Uh, and that's what, of course, we should always do 
in life. But, but it, I mean, you think about divorce mediation, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And it really depends who does it and the, the goodwill of the parties when they enter into it. Okay, following up on that, there's a pop culture question here. Your comments on, also from Anonymous, your comments on retribution suggest that you might not like the movie Promising Young Woman. What are your thoughts on that movie if you've seen it? If you haven't, we can move on. I haven't seen it, but let me sort of take another example. Uh, I did love the movie Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. And I think that actually brings out some of my points about how the obsessiveness of retributivism eats into people and in, in some ways corrupts their relationships. I'll just give you one more example, which is something that I'm teaching right now. I've been writing my class notes, namely Dead Man Walking. So Dead Man Walking, of course, it's both a movie and an opera. And as, as it happens, I'm teaching the opera because Jake Heggie, the composer, is visiting my class and it's an exciting thing. But anyway, in that story, you remember that the convict who's on death row, that Sister Helen Prajeev is trying to help, he has killed two young people. And so all four parents of the children are there. And again, they are obsessed with this, putting this guy to death as though it was some kind of surrogate for the loss of their children. And I think they, they actually somehow believe that by executing that killer, they're gonna get back something of their children's lost life. And of course they don't. And one of the four along the way starts thinking differently. And he takes Sister Helen aside and he says, you know, Sister Helen, I'm arguing a lot with my wife these days and we don't get along at all because I, I'm beginning to see things differently. And I'm wondering what good all this does. So, so that's basically me <laughs> and I think, you know, it, it, it just doesn't do any good. It doesn't do good in divorce, where if you focus on making the other person suffer, you're not going to have help to move forward toward better lives for your children and so on. So I, I should see Promising Young Woman. I just haven't, because I'm teaching opera, and my, all my spare time has been spent listening to and, and watching operas this quarter. But as soon as I'm finished teaching, I'll have a chance to see some movies. Sounds good, okay. This is from, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, Rafi Resnick. What is behind the idea of Citadel? It seems to track a broader American culture of the frontier, siege mentality, and negative liberty as exhaustive of justice. Would you agree that as a political subject, the American is always defending himself against threats and always in search of such threats to defend himself against. Well, probably that's right. I mean, I just use the word in its traditional sense of a fortress. And it, 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 it's, I wanted to emphasize the way in which it's not just that these people refuse to admit accountability, but they've arranged to be protected by walls that are there in the systems that they inhabit. So what is it about the situation in college sports that makes it so more difficult to reform than the issue in professional sports because there are these structures, the role of investment companies, the role of the collective action problem and so that insulate wrongdoers from full accountability. And it's very interesting in, in two of my three citadels, there's a character who migrates from the citadel to a normal workplace where there are normal rules. The singer David Daniels uh, stopped singing pretty much and he went to a university job the minute he did, then the whistleblowers brought out their complaints, they were heard, and he was dismissed from the university job. And it happened so quickly because everyone knew that he was abusing young men, but they, they didn't really know what to do about it so long as he was in the unstructured world. And so the same thing very much happened to the athlete that I focus on most precisely in, in the sports part, Jameis Winston, who did a, commit a rape while he was a star at Florida State University. But then he got into the NFL and right away, he, there was an accusation against him. They listened to it, they suspended him. It wasn't rape, it was groping. Uh, and you know they suspended him for a while. And over the course of this time in the NFL, the, it seems to be the case that he's really cleaned up his act. He stopped drinking, he stopped going to bars, he's gotten engaged to be married and so on. And he's turned into the, the kind of 
fine person that he always had the potential to be. So th th that's the result of the world that he inhabits. That, so that's what I really wanted to bring out with the idea of citadels. You lose those walls, then you got to shape up. Okay. Susan Bell, the comparison to witch trials, brandings, et cetera, strike me as inexact. While modern social media content is certainly pervasive in our lives, generally the rich and powerful men targeted by significant social media onslaughts face none or almost none of the corresponding physical consequences associated with the analogies you make. By virtue of their power and privilege, they are still insulated from any real mob-driven consequences for their alleged actions. How do you reconcile these substantive differences? Well, we gotta remember that Me Too doesn't just target the people in my citadels. And of course, because they're in the citadels and the citadels have not been structurally reformed, they're gonna be escape accountability for a while. Now, of course, Harvey Weinstein didn't and Bill Cosby didn't, so we're making progress. But no, I mean, Me Too has targeted all kinds of people, a, a rumor about, any one of us could go viral tomorrow and anyone can be accused truly or falsely. And, and so I was thinking more of the, the, the lesser known people who are not protected and you know the way that saying somebody raped me can be of course true, but unless there's some sifting of the evidence of some kind. And then the question is, what do we do if it's past the statute of limitations and there's no possibility of, of bringing a criminal charge that's why I favor ending the statute of limitations for rape, as many states have done by now. Then what, how is the sifting going to take place? That's a fair question. And I think workplaces of different kinds are figuring out how to answer that question. So if somebody in a law firm is targeted, there are processes of sifting evidence that they can go to. And yet, if it takes place on social media, that may not be enough. So, I mean, uh, we, we all have probably been falsely accused at one time or another, I venture to say. But in this era, it's much easier for it to sink a whole life. I myself, have not, I haven't been falsely accused of a sexual offense, but I've been falsely accused of perjury for my expert testimony in the trial of Romer versus Evans by the other side who wanted to make me a spectacle. And, you know, they tried to stop me from being hired by the University of Chicago and so they didn't succeed because the university convened a tribunal of expert scholars. They examined all the evidence and they said, this is just junk and not, not worth anything. But suppose it was today, you know, this was back in 1993 or something, or 1994. But if it were today, it would spread so virally and so far that I don't know, you know, by the time that the truth was gotten to, it, especially because it was a truth about the translation of texts from ancient Greek, which is particularly hard to pin down, you know, it would have probably done much more damage and much more harm. So that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. Another anonymous question. Why do you think some women, more than we would imagine, vote for and support men that are openly misogynistic? Is there anything we can do about this? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, well, you know, the first thing is, of course, there might be just an overlap between the policies that they like for other reasons and the policies that that person is pursuing. And I actually think that in the uh, first election when Trump was the candidate, a lot of women voted for Trump holding their noses at the misogyny, but just thinking I'm a conservative and I want a conservative candidate. So that's Part of it. And I, I think that's why in the second election, it was a turn away in the suburbs and among women. You, you can look at the stats on that. But, um, but anyway, another thing is that, of course, women are brought up to stand by your man. And if the man is suffering, and a lot of the, uh, the outrage in American society <coughs> and feminism <coughs> comes from working class men who are, have real problems who have health issues, who have employment issues, and the women who stand by them and support them think, well, I better you know, stand, stand by the candidates that that person supports. But I do think that there are limits to that. I actually am a big 
supporter, and I'm holding soon a fundraiser for Lauren Underwood, who's a congresswoman from a suburban district in Chicago, who beat twice now a Republican, in well, first time the incumbent and the second time a challenger, and in a district that both times Trump won by about six percentage points. And she did it by going and talking to women. She said, I don't care, you can call them Karen or whatever. She's an African-American woman. She goes and talks to them about real things, about maternal health, about infant mortality. She's a former nurse. So, you know, she, I think women listen when people approach them and talk to them about the things that matter most to them. And, and that's what I have a lot of hope for. Speaking of, you mentioned standing by your man, Anonymous asks, what do you think about rich elderly men who marry sequentially beautiful women young enough to be their grandchildren, Trump, Larry King, et cetera? <laughs> well, I mean, of course, I, I, being an older woman, I always think, you know, oh, why, why, why not me? No, I, I, I think it is a bad pattern. On the other hand, I also want to say, as somebody who's very opposed to all forms of age discrimination, that if the pattern were equal on both sides, then I would see nothing wrong to it, with it so long as there's consent and so forth. That is increasingly, I think it's becoming possible for older women to have relationships with younger men and for people not to think, oh, this is grotesque and this is terrible. So, I mean, if we were an equal, gender equal culture, then I think age difference shouldn't matter. What should matter is the people and how they get along with each other. But as it is, of course, it's part of male domination of women. And, and that's why one should raise an eyebrow anyway. Okay. Here's another anonymous. Thank you for writing your book and presenting it. What are your thoughts on confidentiality agreements in general and signing them or not? Yeah, no, that is a very tough one. It used to be the case that when in a university, when someone was charged with sexual harassment and convicted by a tribunal, there was always a confidentiality agreement attached. I think, you know, you can see the reason for this because maybe the person would actually start over again and be educated and reintegrated. And I think in some parts of the Title IX process, particularly when it involves young graduate students who are about to go on the job market, I'm all in favor of confidentiality uh, as part of the Title IX process. I've seen cases where a person really has changed and the, often it's accompanied by giving up alcohol and they, they just don't grope women anymore at parties. But you know, if it's a faculty member and if they're convicted of harassing a graduate student or another faculty member, it's very problematic because that faculty member, if they're not actually fired, then they will continue to be there and then they'll be able to move somewhere else without anyone knowing anything about what they've done. So in one case that I know quite well, a person who had been convicted at University A was gonna be hired by University B and B could not know of that prior conviction. I knew about it because the chair of the department at University A, who was, had then in the meantime moved to the University of Chicago, told me in confidence because some people were thinking of hiring this person at the University of Chicago. And so this guy says, you know, don't do it. This is what happened at University A. And so I knew about it, but I couldn't talk about it because it would get this friend of mine in trouble because he was violating a confidentiality agreement. So all of that was very bad. So all I could do was just avoid this person and try not to invite this person to places. But later when at University B, he did get hired and he started having accusations then. I did actually talk to some people and uh, with the permission of my friend who had moved and he too eventually came forward and no one bothered with him, it was years later. So they didn't try to hold him accountable for violating that agreement. I think it's very problematic. At Harvard, we know that there's a case where the person was reprimanded and then went on offending for years and years and years and years. And it was only at the end of about, I guess it was probably two years ago or something that this person eventually got fired, although it was first known to me. I mean, the first violation was known to me in about 19, um, 
1980 or something like that. So it was a long period of offending that was papered over by this confidentiality agreement. Uh, so I think if it's a serious offense and it's of a, an, a, an adult who uh, should uh, you know, be held to account, then probably we, we should not keep it confidential. That is controversial. But I, that's what I've come to believe because it would protect so many more future people from harm. Are the allegations against Justice Thomas and more recently Justice Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh oh, my screen went up, uh, more recently Justice Kavanaugh a step forward because they were so publicly aired or a step back because they're both in lifetime positions on the Supreme Court? Well, of course, Justice Thomas, I, I say in the book that I think he, sh if it had ever been litigated, as the facts are known to us all, he should have lost. He should have been found guilty of work, pervasive uh, workplace harassment. But, you know, first of all, we were never allowed to hear all the facts. So it was so that, and I, and, and there was no litigation. And furthermore, there are other people with similar fact patterns that have actually uh, one, and, and the reason is that the concept of harassment that's serious and pervasive is underdefined. Different judges interpret it in different ways. And there's one case I talk about that's very like the fact pattern in Thomas's case, where this guy was said, the judge, who was a very good judge, who had, had very landmark rulings in sexual harassment. But in this particular case, he says, oh, this is a, an oaf and a boorish type of person. How, who could take that seriously? But he just wasn't thinking from the woman's point of view. So I think that anyway, that's that's what I say about Justice Thomas. And I, I think it was, I think now, it, by now it's a step forward because we see it in a context of years of workplace harassment litigation, where we now see something of what we need to prove in order to get a, 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 a result on that. But we also see, and this is what Judge Diane Wood on the Seventh Circuit has recently written an excellent article about that I, that I talk about. We see what needs more needs to be done. We need to have much more clear definition of what serious is, what pervasive is, and the case by case approach has not served us well. So yeah, it's a partial victory. Kavanaugh, I mean, the whole thing was so badly handled from beginning to end. This woman who didn't want to come forward was led to go come forward and then, they just didn't do a thorough investigation at all. They refused to question the witnesses who would have talked about his history of alcohol problems and blackouts and so on. And uh, so the whole thing victimized her over again. And that was really unfortunate. Uh, you know, we don't really know exactly the truth. If I had to hazard a guess, I, I think he blacked out and just doesn't fully know what he did. But we also know from those hearings that he was not above lying. Because when he says he was a clerk for Alex Kaczynski and Kaczynski was a major mentor, when he says, oh, I knew nothing about that, namely that he was harassing women in his chamber, that does not pass the laugh test because everyone knew about Kaczynski. It was so widely known that our university didn't recommend people to his chambers and you know, it was just a common common knowledge so that his very close mentee would not know about that just is incredible. So I think he's capable of lying. And I, I think it's very likely that he did lie in that case. And it, it, so it was a very sad episode for Christine Blasey Ford, who was a very woman of great um, grace and articulateness and achievement and so on she was misled and the whole thing was very badly handled. Uh, so that is a temporary setback, sure. But I think you, we, we all know that if, if somebody comes into court with that kind of memory, even after quite a long time, we can get a conviction. And now that the statute of limitations has been removed in lots of states, we're getting more and more of these cases. If the witnesses are there and there's some evidence, but even if it's just the testimony of the woman, a good district attorney knows how to win that kind of case. There are many such cases where the person gets convicted. They have to do it carefully. They have to exclude from the jury people who are likely to be um, 
too zealous in, in defense of the, the accused and so forth. And in the other way around too, jury selection is key in any kind of case where it's a he said, she said, I myself have been excluded from such a case because of my history of sexual assault and the fact that Law and Order SVU is my favorite TV program. So a good defense attorney is gonna nix me from the beginning. So that's the kind of complicated procedural thing that we have to go through to get a jury that's relatively unbiased. It was remarkable that the Harvey Weinstein jury was selected by that process where I'm sure that Weinstein had the best lawyers and they got rid of the people they could get rid of, but he was still convicted. So I think there is progress when things actually get so far as to be in the court of law. But of course, in this political circus, it, it didn't get anywhere near that. I think I speak for everybody when I say, I wish we had more time. Uh, alas, it is the top of the hour, and I, I'm sorry we couldn't get to more of these questions. They were great questions. Thank you for asking them. Thank you for coming and joining us for such a wonderful conversation. Um, and thank you, everybody out there watching on Zoom. Your patronage is what enables us to bring you wonderful programming like this. And so uh, by way of a gentle reminder, I've dropped the the book link um, to Citadels of Pride, Sexual Abuse, Accountability, and Reconciliation in the chat. It will take you directly to the Politics and Prose website. Um, you can, while you're there, you can check out our events page. Uh, we hope to see you at another event soon. In the meantime, stay well, everyone, and stay well read. And Thank thanks you. so much, Chelsea, and thanks to all of you for your wonderful questions and for just listening to me for, for an hour. So thank you, be well, and keep coming to politics and prose. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye.